the recording button. So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Juan. I'm here today with some 21 participants uh, from the maker community interested uh, some way or another in, in this topic. Uh, I'm sure more people will be coming in soon. Um, so yeah, the, the idea of this, this call is to have uh, different projects present, have a discussion around it. So usually it's around 10 minutes for a presentation and then 20 minutes where we do Q&A uh, kind of free for all where anyone can, can ask questions and, and people from the project discuss. So today we have uh, Stani and Mark from Ave, and then we have uh, well, Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss from Gemini presenting GSD. Um, Mark, Stani, are you guys ready? Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess I can do a, a, a freestyle presentation a bit about the, uh, uh, the Lent and, and Ave token and I give some background, right? Sounds good, yeah. Okay, good. So, uh, so as, as many of you all uh, know, Aave is a uh, project and a community in, in decentralized finance. Uh, so uh, we as a team, we're, we're uh, contrib contributing to build the uh, Aave protocol. And Aave protocol, in essence, is a money market protocol where you can uh, deposit assets, uh, such as stablecoin, such as DAI, uh, and in the future, USD as well, and earn interest uh, in permissionless uh, fashion. And when you deposit into Aave, you, uh, you can actually exercise a credit line or delegate that credit line to uh, someone else you trust or to another uh, smart contract that is uh, in, in, in DeFi. Uh, we started Aave uh, way back ago. We, we were uh, under the name of uh, ETH Lend, which was uh, short for Ethereum Lending. So Ethereum Lending started uh, in roughly 2016, late. Uh, we released on 2017 January, um, our first uh, Coban uh, release and May 2017 or main uh, release of a lending protocol, which was back then uh, the first uh, on-chain lending protocol kind of those uh, times where there, there wasn't much of an ecosystem around and, and uh, the model was uh, more towards peer-to-peer uh, -to -peer fashioned over collateralized lending. Uh, the space has evolved since then. So uh, systemic risk and, and uh, risk modeling has taken more uh, place. And, and usually when we create new markets or list new assets into Aave. We, we have a uh, internal risk policy and we have a actuary who's leading our uh, risk assessment. And based on that, we uh, currently uh, list different kinds of uh, assets depending on, on the systemic and, and uh, counterparty risk that is in, involved. In, in the current state, uh, the, the protocol has grown quite substantially and we launched the other protocol in January uh, or latest uh, release and it holds roughly over uh, 1.2 to 1.5 billion worth of uh, assets uh, on, on smart contracts. And the unique features of Aave is that we have natively implemented flash loans. So all that liquidity can be borrowed uh, and used uh, without a collateral in the Ethereum ecosystem. We're currently going into a, in a uh, uh, token migration where we are migrating our Lend token to Aave token. So uh, based on the Aavenomics, which is the tokenomics of Aave, uh, we're using the Aave token uh, to provide safety for the protocol, uh, either actively or passively. And by uh, passively, sorry, by actively, we mean that the uh, uh, stakers can actually stake into a safety module. And, and based, of, based on this uh, staking, uh, they're putting their um, tokens uh, into a uh, risk of slashing, which means that if there is some kind of uh, shortfall event, uh, for example, Fed liquidation, smart contract block, or some kind of a attack, uh, those slashed funds up to 30% uh, are used to compensate the uh, deficit. And then we have a maker style passive model where if, that's the, if those staked slashed 
uh, funds are not covering the, the protocol deficit, uh, then there is a protocol recovery uh, facility, which uh, means a certain amount of uh, uh, AVE tokens to cover whatever uh, is needed to compensate the, the protocol to get it out of the deficit state. And there is also a, a built-in uh, backstop module consisting of uh, staking of stable coins to, to bid on those uh, slashed or uh, minted, uh, minted uh, AVE tokens. So in, in essence, the, the idea of the uh, token economics is to provide safety. We have also uh, liquidity, um, uh, liquidity mining kind of like a, a program, but it's, it's not as uh, highlighted as the uh, staking. And the idea of the liquidity mining program is that once you earn rewards by providing liquidity, uh, you're able to bridge them into the safety module. And the idea here is to align the liquidity providers and the stakers towards providing a safer ecosystem. And why this is important is, is because uh, once we want more adoption, uh, not just for Aave, but in, in general in DeFi space, uh, security and safety is the most important thing uh, and not the actual, uh, the high yields and, and, and so forth, what we have seen uh, recently uh, in DeFi. Uh, yeah, I think uh, this is like the short <laughs> version of the presentation. I think Mark probably has something to add as well. Uh, I would also add uh, on the liquidity side, which is really important when you consider an asset as collateral uh, for uh, a CDP or vault. Um, we have an uh, ongoing uh, and partnership with Balancer Labs and part of the safety module will actually be used to provide liquidity uh, on the decentralized finance automatic market maker Balancer. So we can expect uh, after the migration from the main to the AVE assets to have very deep liquidity and decentralized liquidity on the assets, which will help a lot the work of the potential keeper if that's needed. The interesting part about the uh, token history and, and the, all the asset history is that uh, it has been on the market for almost uh, three years now and in, in, in total. And, and it, as a kind of like a holder and community that we have is, is very diverse. So it doesn't consist simply by uh, DeFi super users. Uh, the the AVE product itself is, is very much used by, by uh, super users that are using multiple Protocols, we have common users with, with Maker, uh, with Uniswap, uh, but we also have a very large uh, base of uh, uh, community members that are not actively using DeFi, but are supporting the movement. And in our position, we think it's great because you don't need to be uh, involved in, in financial services on your daily, daily basis or, or even uh, uh, weekly basis if you don't have that urge. And yeah, as um, next plans after the, the, the migration itself, uh, the process is quite technically simple. We deployed today the Covan version tested of the, the, the AVE token. And also we deployed the safety module staking as well uh, today, actually uh, 30 minutes before uh, the, the <laughs> this, uh, this collateral call. And what's cool about that is that uh, our next step is uh, the, the vote on the migration, which might happen in uh, active, which might active, get activated uh, quite soon in a few days. And once that voting period finishes, uh, there is a payload uh, in the uh, uh, governance uh, voting smart contract that activates this uh, migration, which means that the migration will open and anyone can migrate their land into uh, Aave. And what's interesting after that, in terms of the, the our roadmap is that we are focusing on launching our uh, version two of, of the, the protocol itself. And we focus quite a lot in, in also the substantial security, not just covering uh, token economics. Uh, we have currently five auditor companies, uh, high profile auditors that are working on the version two of the uh, protocol. And we also have a formal verification done where we have set quite big uh, budget as well. So the security is, is quite important in, in projects such as uh, Aave and, and MakerDAO, and as they are the base layer of the whole DeFi, 
And I think that is something where, where we are focusing quite a lot. That's about it. <laughs> That's good. That's the first uh, presentation without slides that we, that we had. So definitely a novelty. Does anyone have questions? Uh, I'm sure there has to be, there has to be several. No one. I, I can try starting with with one, Sunny. Um, so my, my my question is uh, maybe it's not super related to to make around the vault, but it's uh, a little bit why did you guys decide to to this kind of split uh, when when going from one token to another? That's more like a on a personal note, and, and I was curious about that. That's actually a pretty good good uh, observation because the the current token itself is, I mean, in in optical view we we update the the name of the token. I mean, pretty much many like the name Lend, uh, but but Aave is, is kind of like more towards our branding as well. But there is a, a actual actual a measure that we want to do is uh, there's two interesting technical features. Is one is that our current model doesn't have the minting facility and, and the ability to mint is important when we want to recover uh, the protocol itself in a similar way as, for example, uh, Maker does. And this is very important for us. And second is that uh, we implemented the, the gasless permit function. So that allows uh, the, the approvals of transactions without gas costs. And that's, that's super awesome. And, and yeah, those are the two important things. You. Anyone? You guys are particularly silent today. I have a question. Good. Hey, Stani. Uh, I don't know if you mentioned it, but like, what's your stance on L2 solutions and how you're handling that yourself and the whole Ava team? Hey, because but... gas prices are going to be uh, staying, not going down, right? Yes. So, uh, L2 is very, very much something that we're researching. Uh, we're putting a lot of effort into actually looking on different kinds of L2 solutions. Uh, pretty much we see a lot of interesting options at the moment. Optimistic rollups, for example, is, is one, one option and we see a lot of movements towards that direction. Uh, we see also some movements in Starkware, which is quite interesting. Uh, we also see very interesting potentials in alternative blockchains in terms of uh, bridging liquidity there. But uh, I think for Aave, it's very important that our headquarters is always in Ethereum because we were born here in the sense of uh, development and we have a strong community uh, and we always felt welcome here. <laughs> and, uh, but in terms of uh, scalability, I, I think we're looking into three different options that we are going to uh, most likely deploy infrastructure. We're still uh, thinking which one of these uh, options we're going to do first or, or uh, finalizing them as well. And it really depends on actually movers uh, that are doing, let's say, uh, liquidity, uh, bringing liquidity in the sense that they have swaps. For example, really depends what Uniswap is looking for, depends what Maker is looking for as well. Because when, what, what is always actually about is more of a uh, secondary market for uh, tokens that have liquidity. So that means basic Uniswap and, and then uh, stable coins, which may, means practically the, the uh, maker system and for example, the Gemini's GUSD. It really depends on them. And uh, our goal is to have infrastructure that we can deploy uh, fairly quickly, whatever there's needs for, for uh, uh, interest rates on chain. And I would like to add on that topic is that uh, there's not one layer two solution that solves all the issue. And as a money market protocol, you have to be neutral and carefully consider what are the use case and what is the user base. So for example, uh, some layer two solution are very much focused on the exchange of tokens, 
for example, but don't do as much smart contract execution. But it can be a very good use case, for example, with the support of A tokens, which are interest bearing assets. So we know that 80% of the user base, not of the volume of or the, the capital, but of the user base of DeFi are people that just ask some stable coin and are looking for passive income in order to mitigate the effect of inflation, for example, where they are. And for them, this kind of layer two solution uh, directly focus on exchanging assets uh, can be very interesting. And maybe other power user will be more interested into uh, smart contract e execution, uh, farming, uh, composability between different protocols, and maybe they, they will need another solution. So for us at RV, we have to stay open minded do carefully our research and we cannot close the door to only one solution. We, we have to focus uh, on the use case first and the needs of the community first. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I had a couple of quick questions. Uh, so is the, the migration complete? So I guess there's a Lend token and that needs to be uh, converted to the Aave token, right? Sorry, I missed that kind of the beginning of the meeting. Yes, exactly. So, so um, the migration, uh, the vote on the migration, there was first signaling, which went very, very well. Uh, from ev everyone was favoring for the who, who participated into four. And now the, the vote starts uh, most likely in a few days. And I see. you're going for a few days. And once the uh, vote ends, what happens is that if, if the vote is successful, the, the payload will, will, will be executed. So it, it, there will, won't be like a separate window of deployment. It will be, it will be deployed uh, with the payload. So that means that the migration contract is deployed and uh, I mean active, and then you can start uh, migrating from Lend to Aave and also to stake tokens as well, if you want to. To use like a DAO terms, it's uh, the payloads, which is like the unforeseeable delay of the outcome of the AIP, so the AVE improvement proposal. Uh, it's the same thing that's paying a cast in the Baker DAO system. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm casting a, a big spell, fan so. of uh, AVE or LEND. Um, I'm just kind of curious. So like one thing I've always envisioned is the A tokens and how that could be uh, collateral, but because they kind of change on their own in terms of the amount, do you guys have any, um, I know this is kind of thinking in the future, but do you guys have any way of, or does anybody on the call know of like, would A tokens, could they eventually be a uh, collateral type? The A tokens as a collateral is is very smart thing. Uh, I mean, it's it's practically receivables of the underlying uh, deposit certificates into Aave uh, with a uh, uh, algorithmic uh, interest increase balance, which is awesome in in that sense. The increase um, uh, it, it really depends uh, how it works, but uh, I mean. In, in, I haven't checked uh, on, on this part in terms of uh, the maker system. Uh, the version two will have a bit more uh, better version of the A tokens since they are uh, fully compliant with the uh, ERC-20 standard. So it allows zero transfers, which will be easier for the developers. But that's a pretty cool, cool idea. Yeah. It's, and... But sorry, from a technical perspective, I don't know if anybody's on this call, like the, the fact that the the token balance increases, right? As you as you gain interest, is that an issue on the on the maker side for A tokens? Well, I, I think you could always just like build an adapter to account for that. It just may be more complex. Cool. And I think as a product, for example, I. I think ADI as a collateral might be a bit too circular for my test of risk, but uh, for example, AUSDC or, or even better, AGUSD, uh, for example, can be a very interesting product because you have a collateral that grows in value over time. And if uh, have a supply weight can build on average the stability fee on the asset, it can be like a very interesting product.
Cool. Uh, yeah, I'm a fan of your project. Thanks. That's that's it. That's awesome. Does anyone else have any any pressing questions for the team? I guess it's a good sign, Stanley and Mark, to see so many people approving of Ave and and not having a lot of questions. Uh, usually, they are much harder on on our guests. Um, yeah, so if no one has any more questions, I, I guess we can move to, to Tyler and Cameron presenting. Last call. All right. So <laughs> it's blue chip. Yeah, Michael and Brian is saying on the on the chat that Avi is blue chip. All right. So Tyler, are you guys uh, ready to to present? Yep. Um, just one second. I'll put my video on. And and one, um, can you enable screen share, please? Because we have uh, some slides. We'll do. Yes, I think Amy already has done that. Yeah. Great. Um, well, thanks for having us. Um, it's a real honor to be presenting to this project that has such a noble cause. So, um, really excited to to be here. Um, I want to start by saying how. Uh, how much Gemini strongly believes in the promise and ethos of DeFi. I personally was very moved by Mariano Conti's um, story of surviving inflation um, by living the bankless life, earning die, investing in ether. So that, that sort of story and anecdote, anecdote tells me um, all I need to know about how, how important um, this movement is and how um, how, how we want Gemini to, to be involved in it. So um, I think that the way Gemini ultimately as a company can be involved is being the trusted portal um, or bridge into this new world of DeFi. Um, obviously, we're here to, today to talk about the Gemini dollar but we've, and support for it in the, in the Maker Protocol, but we've already actually started um, sort of integrating holistically with DeFi. We we currently list the DAI token for trading and custody on Gemini. Um, we have some other project tokens, such as Link, Orchid, and others listing. Um, and with respect to the Maker token, while I can't talk about our future plans, I can confide in you that we are we are very fond of that token as well. So um, we don't just see the Gemini relationship with with Maker. Um, and other DeFi projects as just, hey, support the Gemini dollar, but really a, a two-way street um, that sort of creates a interesting loop for customers who want to leave the existing world of legacy finance, which is kind of bleak right now, um, and safely travel into this new bankless world on the Ethereum ecosystem. So um, so that's, that's sort of important to sort of lay out our ethos. So why don't we talk... Uh, go straight to or go into sort of the slides of what the Gemini dollar is. I'm going to kind of assume that that the folks on this phone are are more technical than me and are very familiar with the concept of of a regulate a regulated a centralized issue stable coin. Um, we are at least the world's or tied for the worst world's first uh, regulated stable coin. Um, we are issued out of Gemini trust entity by the DFS. We perform um, monthly audits on the account balances and we publish uh, where the dollars that correspond to the Gemini dollars actually reside in what bank, which we think is important for people to understand the concentration risk in the banks, um, where they are. And, and notably those banks are State Street um, and Goldman Sachs. And Marshall, if you could um, bring up just if, for, for people who want to do a deeper dive on the information, um, you can go to Gemini.com slash dollar. And that's sort of our Gemini dollar splash page. Um, and if you scroll down a bit, um, you can go to um, the, the independent accountant reports. And we can take August 31st, 2020, 
Um, if you if you scroll down to page three, um, you can see on footnote two that the well you can see on page three that you know the dollars on the blockchain correspond to the dollars in the account. Footnote number two, um, we published that those dollars are held at State Street and Goldman Sachs. That was actually going through the due diligence process of, of uh, those banks was actually the hardest part about this. It took almost at least a year, maybe closer to two years. Um, so um, moving a lot, BPM is the auditor. Um, they do a lot of um, accounting for publicly traded companies. Um, so they're a formidable accountant auditor. And then lastly, in terms of the audit trail, um, Trail of Bits did, did a security audit. So we've tried to bring the best in class players to together from banking partners, the New York DFS as a regulator, uh, Trail of Bits as a security pen test auditor, and then BPM as an auditor to build a constellation of trust around the Gemini dollar. Um, that's the value we thought we could add. And we think to a certain segment, um, that is what they'll want to see, especially the Wall Street institutional crowd. They, they, the, it's a selling point to understand that they're interacting with a counterparty that's known and regulated and potentially even regulated um, by this, their same regulator. So, I think our message is that um, we provide different value and comfort to different customers, um, but some people may want a decentralized algorithmic stablecoin like DAI. Um, so I think it depends on the appetite and if we want to have the broadest adoption for, um, for, for DeFi and build bridges for people to come on, I think we need to have a diversification of, of the type of, um, instruments that people can do. And I think for the Gemini dollar, um, a lot of institutional customers will find a lot of comfort in, in the constellation of trust that we built. Um, moving back down to slide three, um, we're already integrated um, and supported the Gemini dollar with some projects, namely BlockFi um, for earning interest bearing products. Um, BTG Pactual actually uses the Gemini dollar investors can invest in products and also um, be paid their dividends in GUSD, which is also important for a lot of players because the volatility of, of an F, um, you know, they just don't, they're not quite, they don't quite know how to ha handle that. So um, they think in dollars. So the Gemini dollar is important. Um, we're also integrated with Flexa, which is a decentralized payments network. You can actually, um, they, I believe they also support DAI. So you can actually walk into a Bed Bath & Beyond today, um, open up the Gemini app, go to the pay set, the pay uh, tab, and you can purchase, make a purchase using DAI, Bitcoin, or Gemini dollars. So it's pretty exciting. We haven't talked about it a whole lot, just given the, the pandemic and the lockdowns, we didn't really want to encourage people to necessarily go out and shop, but it's very cool. Um, it works. You can go to Baskin Robbins and um, <laughs> buy ice cream, and you can actually already sort of live on crypto. And I think that was interesting kind of going back to Mariano's talk, he talked about off-ramping um, to sort of pay some bills and, and his credit card. But I think Flex is actually going to attenuate um, his need and other people's need to actually off-ramp um, out of, of crypto. So the idea of spending or using is, is starting to become a reality. Um, and then moving to, to slide four, um, just a little bit of the mechanics, and I'll turn the floor over to Eric Weiner, our VP of Engineering, in a second. Um, but the GUSD is, it's very simply created at the point of withdrawal from the Gemini platform. So if you want to withdraw dollars, you can wire it back to your bank. Or if you want to um, withdraw dollars into the blockchain, then we wrap them, create GUSD in real time, and it will send to the address that you have told us to send the Gemini dollars to. Um, when you want to uh, off-ramp out of GUSD, you send GUSD into the Gemini platform. As soon as it hits us, we re real-time destroy the GUSD on the blockchain. So currently, it's really not possible to hold the GUSD balance on 
Gemini. We don't have a trading book. We don't have a BTC GUSD pair. Um, so the float uh, sort of reflects that potentially a little bit is that we don't, our customers, you know, as soon as they send it to Gemini, it's destroyed. We also do not put balance sheet capital of the firm into GUSD. So um, we try and keep it lean. We think that's just like the most um, accurate way to sort of reflect it, um, or at least that's a tack we take. Um, we cover, currently cover all gas fees for GUSD creation. So it's absolutely free to uh, create GUSD and withdraw to a project. Um, we've processed over $369 million of GSG has been created, um, uh, of which $355 million have been redeemed, and Gemini has never blocked a redemption of GSG. So those are sort of the high points. Um, obviously, we look forward to going into further details if, if necessary during the Q&A. Um, hopefully, we can have as clean, clean of a bill of health as, as the Ave team, but We'll see, um, you know, fire away. But I'll, I'll, I'll sort of pass it over to, to Eric to just kind of go through a little bit more of the mechanics. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Eric, VP of Engineering at Gemini. Um, actually, I think, do we have that video we wanted to show? Uh, this is a video that, that Marshall put together of, it just shows the Gemini interface. So here you've got our our trading interface. Um, when you go to our withdraw page, uh, that's where you can create Gemini dollar. So it's really just when you withdraw dollars out of your Gemini account, we do that that creation and that transfer on the fly. Um, so you see it says there, your USD will be converted to Gemini dollars sent on the Ethereum blockchain. So this is our active trader sort of pro tail interface. We also have a simpler interface that most of our customers use. Um, the sort of the main Gemini interface. And if you flip there, you see uh, what most Gemini customers see when they log in. A pretty simple portfolio and market experience. Um, so you can buy or sell any of these tokens. And then if you wanted to use Gemini dollar, or send it anywhere, um, it's just like any crypto withdrawal, but it comes out of your dollar balance. Um, so you pick your, pick where you're pulling it from. I'm going to pick your destination. Uh, so Marshall has whitelisted addresses, so he doesn't have to type any addresses. That's just a thing he has on his account. Um, puts in this mount. It'll have to go through uh, two-factor authentication and confirmation. And then uh, when he hits this button, uh, after he puts in his 2FA, uh, the contract transaction is either going to um, Create. We're going to call into the smart contract to create that Gemini dollar on the fly, or we'll uh, sometimes we bring it out of a small pool of Gemini dollar we keep around just to save gas fees and all those creation and redemptions. Um, but everything there is already going to be like within basically within 24 hours. We're going to make sure that the funds, the dollar funds for these dollars, are backed in those banking backing bank accounts. All right. Marshall, you want to go to uh, the next slide? I think we'll send this back to Tyler. OK. Um, thanks, Eric. Um, so yeah, last slide, um, I think pretty much covers um, you know, what we do. Um, you know, I think that um, I understand that, that the Maker Protocol has centralized stable coins already um and and we appreciate that that um there is there is a point of failure necessarily with it one um centralized stable coin but if i think if you have enough of them it actually creates a some form of decentralization there um so i think that ultimately we can we can provide a strongly regulated um audited transparent um, centrally issued stablecoin to diversify that collateralization type for the Maker Protocol. Um, and with that, I think we're sort of done with our formal presentation. Um, and we'd be happy to break into a Q&A and answer any questions you guys might have. Thank you, Tyler.
Uh, Akash, do you want to want to start? Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Akash. Uh, you know, I wanted to welcome you guys. Uh, so, first question is related to the Gemini Exchange. Like, if we were a market maker and we had to buy G GUSD and redeem it for dollars, um, just to like speed up the process. Like, are you guys on the Silvergate network? or other networks where we can do fast wire transfers? Um, yeah, the short answer is yes. Uh, we do have Silvergate. We sort of consider it sort of like a hot fiat wallet um, to do sort of wires in. We are on the Send network, so that should give you 24 seven coverage. And then um, we sort of consider State Street and Goldman Sachs as sort of our cold fiat wallets where that cash is ultimately swept to. Okay, cool. Uh, that's awesome to hear. The second question is related to, uh, so GUSD is centralized. Like, do you guys have special power over GUSD? So for the example I'm gonna come up with is USDT, where mm -hmm. USDT has special powers where they can pull out USDT from anybody's wallet or anybody's smart contract. Do you, do you guys have that power also? So I think I'll pass it to Eric. Um, he's the most equipped to answer that. Sure. Um, the contract as it currently exists has no, um, no power in it to freeze balances or confiscate balances or do anything that wouldn't operate just like a standard ERC-20 token. Uh, the only exception to that is there is an upgrade mechanism. Um, theoretically, it would be possible for us to upgrade the contract to a new version that had those kinds of functionality. Um, we have no intention or plans to do so um, if as a, as a centralized and as a regulated entity, um, if we were forced by, you know, regulations or by legal proceedings in order to do so, uh, that might be possible in the future. Um, it would be patently obvious that that would be happening, though, uh, as it would require um, swapping out the, the back end contract implementation. So as of now, there's no, there's no freeze function on the okay. contract itself. That's, that sounds fine. Um, so, so let me ask a question for the, the people that are here who are more, who are more uh, technical than me. Like if you guys were to upgrade, what consequence is that to the GUSD that's in the maker system? I'm just throwing it out. It's a very low probability event, but I'm just asking. We had this situation in the past where where one token was upgraded and we had to change adapters and, and whatnot on our end to be able to support the token. I think that's the that's what Akashi is referring to and, and Cyrus on the on the side chat as well. Yeah, I um because we use a proxy contract, uh so the, the ERC twenty spec is all implemented by a proxy contract. Um that stores all the token balances. So even if we were to do any sort of upgrades, um what for any reason. Uh, it shouldn't affect operation of Gemini dollar for anybody. You wouldn't have to say move tokens over to a new contract. You wouldn't have to reprogram how you're using it. Nice. Okay. Is, is there a time lock on the upgrade function? Uh, I believe there is. Um, so we've, we have a couple things going on for the, t for the upgrade function. Uh, the upgrade signers are, is in our is, is really in our Gemini custody system. So in order to execute an upgrade, um, it goes through all the same controls, actually some of the more intense controls that we have uh, just to access, you know, Gemini's most, our, our biggest pool of crypto. Um, so there's time locks both internal to Gemini and I believe coded into the smart contract itself. Um, and it's multi-sig uh, where the signers are stored in hardware, HSMs, in vaults distributed around the U.S. Um, so we have to physically go to those vaults, um, enter those places, sign the transactions there. Uh, I can look up uh, details on what that time lock is, but it is coded into the contract. Thanks, Eric. Anyone else uh, have I have a question? I have a quick question. Um, have you guys thought about um, improving liquidity on other DeFi protocols? Uh, I think I saw you guys getting in, involved in other protocol governance as well. I think that'd be really interesting for us in, in particular, 
curve, for example, because curve stablecoin liquidity is pretty much the the biggest uh, backstop for stablecoins that are in Maker. So I think that would kind of go a long way towards um, uh, GUSD's um, involvement with Maker. So just curious if you guys have any plans for that. Yeah, and I should have uh, started by thanking uh, Monet or Monet Supply for kicking for um, kicking all of this off for us. He he um, put in the MI uh, P6 application that was greenlit for Maker Protocol, um, and then got us on this call. But he's actually put in some proposals, I believe, for Curve, Ave, Compound, and maybe some others. But Yes, we're very much interested in holistically getting involved in other protocols, whether it be Yearn, um, on and on. So, um, so, so the answer is like I guess that's a long-winded way of saying um, yes, we are. Can you guys hear me? Um, yep. So, hey, uh, Brian McMichael from the Smart Contracts team here. I just want to say I did look over the contract briefly uh, at the beginning of this meeting. Uh, it looks good. It's it's nice and, and small. Uh, there is a proxy on there. So I would want to mention that um, if GSD were to be added, um, just keep in touch with us and let us know if you do plan to upgrade that implementation. We can actually uh, pre-whitelist that ahead of time. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing is is kind of checking that on every transaction so that we if the implementation of a of a proxyable contract does change we we kind of lock the adapter down to prevent uh, you know any any uh, malicious attacks on our system um, so you know if you do decide to to change that implementation in the future uh, just work with us and we can uh, we can get that fixed up uh, ahead of time so there's no disruption that's awesome to hear yeah happy to do so I have a question related to uh, kind of the business side of this from your engagement with Goldman uh, Sachs as a depository. Like just in general, how, how, is, how is the contemplated construct if negative interest rates arise? It's question number one. And question number two is have they given guidance as to kind of the maximum scope of deposits that you're allowed to bring on? Yeah, so I haven't been too close to the conversations with uh, potential negative interest rates. Um, maybe Marshall has, he can pop in. Um, but um, to the second point, um, that's one of the things that was so attractive to Goldman Sachs and State Street is there's tremendous capacity to, um, for you know, assets or cash under management for these companies, uh, for, for both of these, these banks. So if, if um, you know, we really, knock it out of the park with Gemini dollar, uh, there will not be a capacity issue anytime in the near future. Um, if anyone from the Gemini team has any points about negative interest rates, I, I haven't um, heard any talk of that in the news coming out of the Fed or anything. Um, you know, I think it would be a different story if the GUSD was really G Euro or some other jurisdiction, but uh, Marshall, if you have greater detail on that, let me know. Otherwise, we can follow up on some of the message boards or over email and give you a, a, a more complete answer. Yeah, my, my, my quick two cents is it's, it's super interesting um, question. Um, obviously, we've yet to, to see that. I think maybe a year ago, we were looking at, you know, 200 bips on, on treasury assets. Um, and now, you know, we're, we're floating, I think, below 50 bips or, or near zero. So the economics of a Gemini dollar as like a corporate entity, um, you know, are, are, are near zero right now. If there were to be instances of negative interest rates, I think that's a a really interesting internal discussion that would be had. Um, I think, you know, uh, there'd be more value in, in accepting that, but I think there's broader implications for uh, any sort of entity and all entities in the world. If the US interest rates do go negative, it's not just the Gemini dollar itself, but I think with the, priori the prioritization of Gemini dollar within Gemini currently, um, as you can see, you know, we, we've talked about the float and, and how it's kind of low. I think 
recently with the rise of DeFi and, and what we see, this is a great entrance point for Gemini to reprioritize this project and, and offer this bridge. Um, and so I think, you know, with that prioritization, if interest rates did go negative, it's probably still something that Gemini would cover and would, you know, want to absolutely keep the, uh, the project alive with. Yeah. And I'm, I'm pretty confident that, um, that Goldman Sachs would have uh, interesting ways to stave off negative interest rates, whether through financial instruments uh, of all the type of banks we could be uh, working with. I think they could get uh, potentially the most creative to stave off a negative interest rate environment. Okay, I'll ask uh, Sarah's question on on the chat but basically when when liquidation happens on maker uh, we need to cycle the assets so people would be bidding to get uh, gusd in this case uh, and the gusd would need to be converted back to DAI to be able to to bet on the well to bid on, on new assets and and do this arbitrage redem redemption loop uh, do you guys know how long would it take to the the full loop Well, um, redemption of, of Gemini dollar on the Gemini platform is really just uh, any same as any Ethereum deposit. So uh, right now it's 12 confirmations. It shows up as dollars in your Gemini account. You could trade that for DAI and, and withdraw that right back out as DAI. Um, so it's really uh, 12 confirmations for the deposit. And then as quick as you can get the withdrawal out um, would be the minimum amount of time you could do to turn it around on Gemini. Uh, so there's also other exchanges that, that support Gemini dollar as well. That's good. I could, I could also add, add something to that. So given that they're on the Silvergate network, uh, as a mark maker, you know, you could basically get USD. You would, you would get the GUSD, you would buy it on auction, send it to Gemini, exchange it for USD, get the USD, let's say back to Coinbase, Mint USDC come back to uh, come back to MakerDAO. Mint die from that. So that entire process could take uh, you know it it, sh it could probably take like five to twenty minutes is my guess, but it's fairly fast given that they're on the Silvergate network. Thank you, Akash. Does anyone else have any any more questions that you would like to ask? This is a bit left field, but have you uh, at all thought about using token incentives to bring more GS GUSD liquidity onto the chain? Um, I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Maybe Eric Marshall does. Are you referring yeah, I mean, to like, uh, are you referring to a model that like what uh, Yearn's doing right now with like YUSD and, and how we can like introduce something like that? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, more broadly, just the, the idea of using, uh, you know, tokens to incentivize bringing liquidity on, onto the chain and potentially, in, you know, incentivizing uh, GUSD in particular contracts like Curve or um, and, and as for what the token incentives are, you know, that could be any number of things, it, you know, it could be GUSD if you wanted to subsidize that or, you know, some other uh, value questionable token. Yes. And, and what I can say is that we have and are looking into having a yield generation component to GUSD. Okay, cool. Thanks. And also, uh, just in terms of liquidity in general, um, you know, we have been uh, speaking with, um, you know, outside uh, market makers and other um, ecosystem participants to increase liquidity for GUSD uh, all over the ecosystem, uh, whether in locking in vaults on Maker or in other uh, liquidity pools that are being set up now. Awesome, thanks. 
Cool. So I have, um, first of all, thank you for your entire team at uh, Gemini for coming on and uh, talking to the maker community. Really appreciate that. I guess I have a call, uh, question to your team with regards to your interpretation of what the SEC released on Monday uh, with regards to the OCC and what the future of stable coins looks like for you, um, in your opinion, obviously. Uh, also, I saw that the EU, uh, somebody in the EU was saying that uh, maybe we shouldn't call them stable coins, uh, call them something else, since some of them are not stable, right? Uh, so just want to hear you guys' opinion on uh, the future of what I like to call stable coins. Sure, I'll take a I'll take a stab at that. Um, so, and Cameron can can hop in here if I'm getting something wrong. I'm trying to put my legal hat on, but we're basically um, much of um, outside of the DFS. Um, we're actually much of the licensing for the Gemini dollar is money falls under money transmission. It's, I think, technically called an open loop um, store of value, similar to a gift card. So the form factor may be cryptocurrency or a crypto wrapping of dollars, but ultimately um, it's a, a similar legal uh, designation as, as like a gift card that you get, you know, you go into Dwayne Reed or 7-Eleven and you buy um, an Amazon gift card or something. So we believe the legal precedent is, is understood and well-traveled, at least in the U.S. Now there are other jurisdictions um, like Singapore where it's a little less clear if they want to treat these uh, a stable coin like a security. Um, I haven't read the SEC uh, specific guidance but we feel pretty confident that we have all of the licenses and understand the legal framework and theories for GUSD, at least in the US. So, um, you know, I, hopefully that, that answers it. But if there's something about that, um, about that SEC guidance um, that you think um, that you wanna tell me, um, I also could, could try and talk to that specifically as well. Yes, yeah, so I guess the um, the notice that they put out on September 21st on Monday was uh, it kind of felt to me the way I was reading it, uh, and I'll try to post it on here real quick. Uh, like they were in acceptance of stable coins like G GUSD and USDC, um, but when it comes to um, uh, like ours, Dai, um, they're still kind of questionable. So. Uh, I kind of wanted to get your opinion on that. It's still not clear, right? They always say that if you have any questions with regards to making an algorithmically uh, stable coin, quote unquote, uh, to contact them, uh, FinHub. Um, so I just kind of wanted to get an idea what you think the future is, if stable coins are going to stay around, or is this going to be something that five years from now we're going to remember as something that we tried and that we just couldn't, uh, couldn't pull it off, I guess. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's a great question. Um, I'd say ultimately the um, the more decentralized the project is, the harder it is for it not to live on. Um, you know, earlier incarnations of Bitcoin um, were quashed for one reason or another because they lacked the decentralization breakthrough. So I think very much. Uh, Bitcoin, it's just too hard to kill. So regulators have learned to adapt to it and accept it. And I feel like that's definitely got to be the path forward to some of the projects. I think it's probably dangerous to be a little bit in between in this world, um, either be decentralized like the internet and make it too risky to shut down the internet, because ultimately that's what you'd have to do to stop Bitcoin and you'd have to, you know, give up that become sort of North Korea and give up so much else. So many drive companies that drive the U S economy that you just can't do it. Um, so just completely off the cuff, I would say like, if you're going to be centralized, um, do it the right way, talk to the regulators and, and get the dialogue going. If you're not going to take that path, um, ultimately then I would be, 
decentralized. I think that's, that's, you know, I, I would definitely double down and sort of lean into to that path as well. And Tyler, I would just add that the OCC is a U.S. federal regulator. It's a federal bank regulator. Um, the Gemini dollar is regulated by New York DFS, which is a state uh, regulator. And we've gotten approvals in all the states in which we operate. Um, so I think this is more um, of sort of confirmation of that these instruments are sort of regulated and they're safe to use. I think, Tyler, you made the point about the more decentralized a stable coin is, the harder it is to sort of shut down, but it's also probably the harder it is to get regulators ultimately comfortable. But I would view this as a very good positive step in the right direction and sort of confirmation of what we already know, which is that open loop stored value um, in the form of gift cards is really state money transmission um, it's a well understood tried and true path and the Gemini dollar is simply just a different cryptographic, uh, form factor. Um, but these instruments are super, are totally valid. Um, and, uh, I think this is a, a good, a very strong development. Yeah. And I, I think also the fact that we trade die on Gemini trust company, which is regulated by the New York uh, DFS. We also trade uh, Zcash for, you know, people can buy, sell, and store Zcash. And um, regulators, you know, the DFS has got comfortable with a privacy-oriented coin like Zcash. So I think there's an education thing here. Um, I think the more regulators understand um, the positive um, nature of what's happening here, like a lot of times their initial reaction is like, oh, you're trying to do something bad. This is for gangsters and illicit activity. But the more we can elevate stories like Mariano's story of surviving inflation and living bankless and the benefits of that, I think that's great. And I think, um, I think engagement is always important. Like having someone in the community um, that talking to the fintechs hub and, and educating them is a huge, um, I think it can go a long way. It, we've certainly in our own story have, have done a lot of that with regulators and seen them come full circle, um, completely skeptics on Bitcoin. Um, in fact, our first interaction with the DFS was getting subpoenaed um, about Bitcoin. Um, so it was a little antagonistic, um, but we went in there and we said, hey, it's, it's not a Ponzi scheme, there's a fixed supply. Um, there's a lot of technical merit here. Yes, there's Silk Road happening over there, but I think that's really the minority of the activity. Um, and there's so much um, good here. So I, I think you have a great story. Um, I do think you guys are working on something that is forever changing the world. Um, you're part of this DeFi revolution. And I think most of the regulars are, are quite sophisticated and they will see that. So. I am a big fan of education and, and telling the story, but I also think that, you know, this is a global movement and what you guys are doing is global. Um, it's not the purview or jurisdiction of, of any one um, regulator. And I think that's very much your strength. You're helping people in Argentina, Venezuela, other parts of the world, um, even in the U S. So, um, you know, I think, I think, I think that's, you know, you're in a great spot. Thank you so much for the kind words, uh, Tyler. That's really, really nice. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. This is a great community. The maker community is uh, super strong. Um, sometimes we're not the most popular folks on uh, Twitter, crypto Twitter, but you know, uh, I think we have a great community and I think we're going to continue to push forward and, uh, you know, together with, with Gemini and others, we, I think we can do some great things. I look forward to voting on this uh, pretty soon. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, look, we're going to do our part to, we have a great relationship with a lot of regulators. Uh, we just got an EMI license with the FCA. We are in a license, FCA is in London. Um, we're obviously with the DFS in New York. We deal with 50 state regulators in the, uh, the other 49 states in the U.S. Um, we're also in a licensing process with the MAS at Singapore. So we have an ongoing conversation with many regulators in the, um, around the world um, and, and very respected regulators. And we'll certainly do our part to um, spread the word and the story 
about dyes. So you can count us on your side there. Cool. Thank you. Do we have any closing questions before we call it a, a day? All right. I'll take it as a no. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Stani, Mark, Tyler, Eric, Marshall, and Cameron, and everyone else for participating. Again, let's keep the, the conversation going in the forum. If you want to present a project, uh, well, you know the link. I just posted on the on the chat. And yeah, thank you all for, for coming. Let's keep this uh, rolling. Thank you Thanks all. for your time, everyone. It's been a pleasure. All right. See you on the forums.